The central dogma of biology is the idea that we are all made of cells, and these cells are constructed based on information contained in genetic material, which acts as the blueprint for the formation of all structures or all forms of life, which then allow life to perform specific functions. But when you look at life, those forms and those functions are performed thanks to other molecules that we call proteins. Proteins are the building blocks of life and also the machines which allow life to do what it does. So proteins will give life its shape and therefore what life can actually perform, form and function. But those forms and functions are based on the genetic material. So how do you go from genetic material to, to form and function or to proteins? How do you go from DNA to proteins? That is the central dogma of biology. Now, we understand now that this process involves something that we now call gene expression or protein synthesis. And there is a mediary molecules which perform the process. Much of them involve a, a third molecule called RNA. RNA acts as a carrier molecule, a messenger molecule, a catalytic molecule, structural molecule, regulatory molecule. It performs multiple jobs in the in-between DNA and, and, and proteins. It's what's involved in the process of transcription and translation of the genetic code from DNA to RNA and then from RNA to protein. That's the central dogma of biology. Now, of course, it's much more complex than that. You're also going to need mechanisms to maintain the structure of the DNA, to replicate the DNA, to make sure the DNA is inherited from life form to life form, from generation across generation, so that goes things like mitosis and meiosis. You're going to need mechanisms to, to uh, modify the protein once, once it's completed. You're going to need mechanisms to control whether or not this process is even activated, so it's gene expression control, so the cells doesn't waste energy producing molecules which are useless. You're going to need mechanisms to allow the cell to understand what's happening in its environment so that it can activate the proper mechanisms. So that's cell communication and response to the environment. You're going to need mechanisms for metabolism so that you have energy to perform these functions. So all this complexity, how can that possibly have evolved? In this next two videos, I'm going to be focusing on the evolution of the genetic code, which is one aspect of this whole picture. Now, of course, there's a whole lecture series dedicated to each one of these mechanisms, but in this lecture, I want to talk about how does the genetic code even evolve? How do you get from this system where DNA codes for RNA, which then codes for protein? Now, some of the things we know tell us that there is a, a process that came from the same original life forms because the genetic code process is pretty much universal. Every single life form on us does this. Every single life form on us is based on genetic material that gets transcribed and then translated into protein. Which mechanism of actually doing it is similar. There's a little bit of differences across life, but for the most part, the, the structure of what happens to make this happen is pretty much the same. Also the same is that the fact that the most genetic material is DNA and that the DNA is pretty much conserved. There's a lot of parts of the DNA sequences which are the same across all life. And then when you look at DNA itself, the structure of DNA is the same across all life. And when you look at that, the reason why the structure is the same, you realize that the building blocks for the DNA is the same across all life. All life is ba based on DNA based on the same four nucleotides, thymine, cytosine, adenine, and guanine. And that in RNA, it's the same thing, except you replace time in uracil, which is more stable in a molecule, which is not a double helix. But the same building blocks build the genetic code for all life. All life is also based on a triplet DNA code, where every three nucleotides represents one amino acid in the sequence that's going to become the protein. So that in the language of life, Every three letters is a word, and that's a universal fact. It's not four, it's not five, it's not six and one and four. All life is based on this triplet code. All life is also based on the same kind of triplet code. It's like every single life form on Earth speaks the same language. The same three letters mean the same thing for all life forms. Now, there's a few exceptions here and there, but those are because of mutations and because some life forms use extra amino acids and there's a little bit of variation, but that for the most part, I would say, most life forms on earth use the same language of life. All of those similarities indicate that life came from the same ancestral life and that evolved very early on in the natural history of our planet. And so let's talk about what is the process of evolving of this genetic code. Now, remember we talked about in the previous videos about the idea of how you go from simple molecules and then to complex molecules and we proved that through the Miller-Urey experiment and we talk about volcanic experiments and variations of the Miller-Urey experiment that show that that's possible and we can also say that molecules like that could have come from outer space because there's evidence from space 
organic chemistry even without the presence of life. Then we then talk about the fact that from these complex monomers we can form even more complex polymers and that spontaneous polymerization is possible in the, in, the, in the presence of heat which will be available in things like hydrothermal vents in the early earth. And so you get things like liposomes and coacervates and self-replicating molecules. Now, as soon as you get a self-replicating molecule inside one of those vesicles of a liposome, you get what's called a protobiont. And just the fact that it has a self-replicating molecule inside provides it an advantage because the self-replicating molecule will increase the osmolarity inside of the, of the vesicle, allowing the vesicle to absorb more water, become larger, absorb smaller molecules, and then get bigger and bigger, and then break apart and let its constituent parts uh, continue the process and replicate more and more again. So any vesicle that had a self-replicating molecule that would replicate faster will have an advantage, and that's the beginning of natural selection. And then we talk about what steps would be necessary for the early life to get to the life that we have today. Steps that include things like, you know, using the same nucleotides, the more common nucleotides, and that's how we get to the same five. Steps that include, you know, the most simple code as possible, and that's where we have three triplet codes. Structures that make a replication easier. Structures that provide metabolic activity advantages, so, such as enzymatic catalytic properties. Structures that perform multiple purposes. Structures that in, in, in enhance the replication rate. Structures that facilitate the charging of monomers so you don't necessarily need heat to make polymerization simpler and more spontaneous. Structures that ba build better lipids and better polymers to make the structures of the, of the coacervase, the liposomes, or those early cells become more inte the integrity may be maintained structures that would maintain the integrity of the membrane and enhance the interaction with the environment structures that will regulate this process structures that will improve the replication and the fidelity of the codes which were evolving early on all of these things based on simple chemistry physics explains the way the biology works the way it does now, more than likely, these structures that we're talking about, these self-replicating molecules, were probably uh, RNA-like, such as ribozymes. Laboratory experiments have confirmed that it's possible for ribozymes to spontaneously form from one common ancestral ribozyme into several different types of ribozymes inside of a solution, even in the absence of life. Ribozymes will self-replicate and go undergo mutations during those self-replication processes, leading to the formation of multiple ribozymes from the same original ribozyme ancestor. And this is a you see the screen here as an example of, of an experiment such as this, which performs several different types of ribozymes were found in the solution after the introduction of one original ribozyme and the building blocks to allow itself to catabolize and replicate itself. So this evolution of ribozymes has been shown in the lab. Now the reason why scientists think that these molecules were the original molecules of life in painting a picture of an early RNA world is because these molecules not only can self-polymerize and copy themselves but they also act as, as catalysts for the formation of other molecules and therefore speed up chemical reactions which were necessary on the early life. Not only that, it's easy to imagine how you would go from RNA to DNA because RNA is a single-stranded molecule and DNA is basically the same thing but double-stranded. So you, RNA could act as a template for itself and double up and form a double-stranded RNA molecule which could then easily be changed to DNA by substituting, you know, uh, uracil for thymine. So RNA could probably be the precursor for a double-stranded DNA molecule and RNA can also help in the formation of proteins. So because it's the middle ground between the proteins and DNA, RNA was probably the original molecule of life. And the other thing is that RNA today even does multiple jobs because then it's a self-replicating, versatile, and easy to see the jump from that to DNA and to proteins. Evidence suggests that RNA was the original molecule of life. But the thing about such ribozymes is that these RNA molecules acting like enzymes usually need what we call a cofactor in order to work. It's like a key that activates the molecule. Now, today we see that in a ribosome, which is based on RNA and protein, so they act together. But it's much more complex than you would have in a simpler ribozymes. Those ribozymes that evolved in the laboratory and that we've seen them happening, they're basically only requiring two amino acid chains put together. So it's a, a micropeptide of only two amino acids long. So it's a very simple chain. And of course, you would find such simple chains already in the primordial soup because spontaneous formation of micropeptides have been found to actually occur through uh, heat sources, which would be available in things like hydrothermal vents. Of course, the ribozyme would have to scour the primordial soup to find the micropeptide that it needed to activate its structure in order for it to function. So 
Although early ribozymes could have simply found the cofactors in the environment, any protocell that could synthesize these cofactors by itself would have a huge advantage over other protocells that could not, because they would not need to look for the, the, the micropeptide cofactors, they would produce them themselves. So how could a cell produce its own micropeptide cofactors? Well, there's also have been laboratory uh, experiments that have shown that ribozymes can also act as as catalyst for the formation of peptide bonds between amino acids. So two separate ribozymes can join or be attracted to each other and if they are carrying amino acids on them they can bring the amino acids close together and then form a, uh, facilitate the formation of a peptide bond and systems like this evolve spontaneously in the laboratory without the pre-existence of life so ribozymes like that actually exist so ribozymes different ribozymes could act as catalysts for the formation of micropeptide cofactors which could then be the uh, cofactors needed for the activation of other ribozymes and so forth so systems like this could be happening in the early cells for the cells to produce their own micropeptides. In the next video, we're going to talk about how we go from here to the evolution of the genetic code. Because remember, what you have now is pressure for the formation of a system that can facilitate the formation of the peptides inside the cell itself so that the, uh, the ribozymes did not need to find that in their environment, but the cell itself would produce its own micropeptides. So in the next video, we're going to talk about how the genetic code evolved to fulfill that niche, that function that was necessary for the early life to explode and, uh, and uh, be what it is today.